A big welcome to everybody who's already here, and especially to uh, Manish and Andrela. Thank you so much for you know uh, being part of this session today. I'm really excited. Um, you know, this is actually I would say about our twelfth or thirteenth workshop at Pivot, and uh, it's unique because a lot of the workshops we have done in the past are very very tech oriented, in the sense we focus primarily on goals like product management or you know ux ui design this is a role that i think transcends tech even though both of you are currently working at tech but i think uh, you know it's definitely unique one for us from that standpoint so uh, very excited for this um you know maybe we can just start with a round of intros uh, you know i can share a little bit about what we do at pivot for people who are unaware but uh, you know, i started pivot recently just about a year and a half ago and the core premise of the platform is to help me people make smoother career transitions from one field one role one function to another uh, as you know a lot of you may have noticed around you since uh, the great resignation since the pandemic lot of people have been making career shifts so not just job hopping but really you know switching up their roles and their functions and uh, you know so pivot was actually invented to help people achieve those uh, drastic career transformations and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that but uh, what i would like to do next is maybe uh, manish if we can just uh, hear a little bit about your background um, you know we have shared with people that you are currently leading sales operations and planning at oyo but it would be great to hear a bit more about your journey and then we can turn it over to andrela So oh, yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Arjun. Uh, you know, so so currently, as you rightly said, I I had the sales operations and planning for for, uh, for the country, and uh, so before that, I've spent a huge amount of time on the telecom industry. So I've spent close to an inordinately long time, fourteen years, in an organization called Vodafone before I moved in over here. Uh, so. Yeah. uh probably also a good case study of how to spend and you know long amount long amount of time in a particular industry or particular company and still keep yourself excited and relevant so so yeah so, so largely telecom largely uh, you know uh, fmcg sales uh, is what i have been i've been doing uh, before i moved in over here here it's more about b2b and digital uh, business that i take care of uh, but largely Uh, offline business, uh, offline sales, distribution, uh, the traditional sales that that we always used to hear about uh, is what I've been doing for 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 many years now. Uh, yeah, that 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 that's about. Perfect, great. Thanks for that. And Andrela, maybe you can just uh, touch upon your journey as well. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, my uh, stint with revenue or revenue oriented roles, I would say, started post MBA. Um, i joined the you know traditional media industry with cnbc um then mm -hmm. moved on to working for print um and and this is someone who pre mba i had done consulting but i didn't want to do anything to do with consulting before of course my mba i was i think one of those odd ones out um uh, wanted to work in in an industry that felt for more real for for the lack of a um a better uh, better explanation i suppose and uh, then you know moved on to tech media new age media ultimately mm -hmm. um i i was working with by dance at tiktok um i was leading some of their key accounts um in india but um we all know what happened there and um i think that was another crossroads in my career when um the question came that do i want to continue with this or do i want to try something new um so i planned out and i i do believe that when you're planning out a transition you you need to think think it through right you need to think through the various steps and uh, that's how i um landed up in amagi because it was a great segue into saas i wanted to uh, pivot to saas uh, sales and uh, this came up um it's it's one of the profitable unicorns that you have in the country and uh, uh, we are very very proud of the products that we uh, sell um and yeah that's how i ended up here it was a great segue into saas and um, uh, loving every uh, day here so that's pretty much my journey so far awesome awesome thanks so much um 
So both of you have tremendous experience in sales. So you know, really excited to kind of unpack all of the learnings you have had so far in your career. I mean, Manish, I I think you said that you spent about fourteen years at Vodafone. I feel like for a lot of people, uh, perhaps some you know some in this session as well, that probably is longer than their total um, you know career experience, work experience. Um, but I think you know. Sales is definitely one of the functions that has gotten impacted in both positive and negative ways uh, since the pandemic. At least that's what we have been hearing from a lot of people around us, right? Um, the obvious challenges became, you know, getting into client meetings because uh, before that, for a lot of people, especially outside of tech industries, it was uh, fairly commonplace in India to, you know, travel to the client site or clients to come to yours and have a in-person meeting. And you know, sales uh, for uh, new forming new relationships requires that uh, you know in-person meeting to build trust and familiarity. And you know, we did hear a lot of frustration and challenges from sales professionals around that. There were a lot of other things that may have worked out well for especially tech companies because uh, of the digital transformation that's taking place. So I'm just sharing this because these are some of the you know overarching trends over the last two three years. Would love to get your take on how these overarching macro trends have impacted sales as an you know as a function as a domain as well as people's careers who are in this uh, sales domain. So maybe Manish, if you want to uh, go ahead first on this one. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. So I, I think what you said was that is absolutely right. I think the pandemic has impacted not only the way we work, but also the way we sell. What also happened is that I think the pandemic has also brought in the Gen Z, uh, you know, right at the top of the of the buying uh, pyramid, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, and that's that's one generation which is which is which was brought up with a lot of apps and technology around them. So they feel uh, very, very attuned to technology and they don't feel out of place. Uh, what has also happened is that uh, <clears throat> in the last two years, I think a uh, lot of our, our buying has become digital. Uh, you know, so yeah. hence the sales has also become quite digital. Um, you know, um, not only is the, are the people in the digital world or the digital sales uh, that were, you know, traditionally they were, but also people in the traditional sales have started to feel the pinch of it because a large part of the consumer has started to move digital. Uh, so yes, in the sales, I think in the sales career, uh, or people who are looking at making a career of sales, I think digital selling or understanding of the digital media, um, you know, has, has become more and more, is getting more and more important. I think it's the digital first buyer who is there, uh, you know, and what has also happened is that you know, the, the market continues to be buyer Buyer centric. It was also there when, when we had the traditional businesses, uh, mm -hmm. but now you know far much more of the buyer than you used to know earlier, because you know the buyer is digital and, and and he leaves behind his footprints and he leaves behind his impressions all over the place. Uh, mm -hmm. But now a salesman also, or I would rather say a sales and marketing guy, now also needs to be a big big data cruncher. He needs to read that data, to analyze that data, to understand, you know, uh, what sales is all about. That's all. So I'll take another 60 seconds, uh, you know. <clears throat> so this is all very, very intuitive when it comes to B2C sales. You know. Guy going to a big basket, buying from there. The guy going to Amazon, and buying from there. But what's also happened in the pandemic is that the B2B business also becomes uh, B2B business, which is all about, you know, building relations, going, whining and dining, and, you know, showing your face to the customer. So I was just out of the town, so I'll talk and say hi to you. That does kind of, you know, reduce a little. I see it picking up slightly at a behavioral level. I would not say at a large trend level, but at a behavioral level, I see that coming back a little. But uh, even B2B sales has become and has started to become very digital. So uh, my, my guess is that, uh, <clears throat> you know, in the last two to three years, I think a um, large change that we're seeing is the sales going digital and, uh, and uh, you know, to prosper now going forward in sales, you need to have a digital background. Not a digital background, but at least you need to have 
knowledge, uh, you know, uh, learn something new, and make yourself relevant. Mm -hmm. Got it. So, I mean, a lot of focus on basically digitizing sales to kind of align with the, the new era of work, uh, you know, which is being done remotely, whether it's the actual work or even how, you know, meetings are set up between sales uh, professionals and buyers and basically in all different dimensions of business. Now, I, I primarily um, what I'm trying to say is that aligning your own skills to the new digital. I think that's, 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 mm -hmm. that's like one needs to have those skills now to survive and to prosper. Got it. Got it. Yeah, I think uh, that's probably the big, uh, you know, 10,000 pound elephant in the room. We had the digital revolution and how it has accelerated since the pandemic. So, Andrila, what are your thoughts uh, about this and perhaps any other key trends apart from this big uh, digital evolution? Um, I think the to attack the first part, I, and Manish did touch upon B2B sales. Majority of my experience has been in B2B sales, right? Institutional sales, where you build those long tail relationships, uh, where, uh, you know, you um, effectively, uh, your, your buyer is buying from a specific salesperson because he or she as, as a buying leader places that trust in that person, right? Which is why we say that, in B2B sales, especially, it's a very relationship-oriented um, um, oriented selling. That's that's literally what uh, decisions are based on because that's where, when you're taking those organizational calls, you want to be able to take those organizational calls, not just on very hardcore rational thinking, but also the intuitive feeling of trust that you place on the person, uh, right? So mm -hmm. that is a key thing. Um, obviously, in-person meetings, Dropping by like to Manisha's point, right? He he mentioned that some, a lot of us, what we would do is uh, currently, by the way, I'm, I'm in Bombay traveling for uh, Mumbai traveling for uh, sales, right? You, you're not even looking at, you know, converting that sales in that particular meeting, but you do drop by and say that, hey, I'm in your area. I was thinking that I'll drop by for maybe a quick coffee, have a quick chat with you, no agenda. Let's just do this, right? Mm -hmm. Did that take a complete backseat um, during the pandemic? Of course, yes. At that, around that time, you know, I had a very, I, I remember when pandemic was becoming a rea reality um, in March 2020, early, early part of March 2020, I had a meeting for IPL. And my husband was like, no, you cannot go because we have a virus around the corner. And I, I'm being very candid here. We had an argument where he did not let me go. And I was like, there cannot be a world. The world will come to a complete stop if IPL doesn't happen in India. And if mm -hmm. I ca cannot go for a meeting for IPL, that's the biggest, biggest media event that we have in, in the country. Um, yeah. But, you know, this is when this was also the time when a lot of sales leaders had to really, really rethink their ways that, yes, this has happened. This is the situation. This is our reality now. So how can we make, make good of this reality? To say that, uh, you know, our in-person meetings, uh, the best way, probably one of the best ways to build those relationships, 100% yes. But are they the only way? Also no. Being a half glass full person, I think what I had to, what I personally did was take a step back and, you know, think about what is it that in in-person meetings that, that makes it conducive for you to build that trust. There is a lot of aspect of body language. There is a lot of aspect of just talking about things that are not directed, really directly related to the sale that you're trying to make, right? You're trying to build that relationship. A lot of us, fail to realize that it, and it is a little unnatural when everyone is a rectangular box on zoom on your laptop to to remember remind yourself that okay there is a real human being on the other side of the of the screen let's focus on building that relationship but yes if you take a step back you can always always do that even on zoom even on a phone call for instance i remember during the second wave which was which was a very traumatic experience collectively it was a very traumatic experience for the country we were um you know mm -hmm. for uh, one of me we had one of these biggest client meetings that was coming up and um a lot of us were introducing ourselves and at that point in time 
the the only thing I, I would say my biggest contribution to that call was that I was like, hey, let's take a step back here. Is everyone here okay? I hope you are fine. I hope everyone in your family is fine. For the mm -hmm. next 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, we did not speak about the uh, the you know work, any work-related conversation at all. We all spoke about how it has been collectively a very, very hard time because literally everyone in that call had probably lost some family or some friend or someone they knew, right? And I would say that that changed the tone of the conversation. You can see that in a in the body language of the mm -hmm. uh, people on the call as well, because suddenly you are humanizing the people who are uh, who you are speaking to remotely. So at the end of the day, yes, did did it require a lot of us to take a step back and rethink how we do sales? Hundred percent, yes. Is it mm -hmm. always good to have those? means because energy is absolutely different also 100 years does it mean that you cannot do you you cannot uh, build those long-lasting relationships with your prospective clients via a zoom or a phone call or those remote meetings i don't think so you you always can at the end of the day you have to be uh, i know there is a lot of uh, you know, we have this impression about salespeople that we have to be flamboyant, we have to be, um, you know, <laughs> larger than life. I think at the end of the day, we need to be genuine people. We need to be genuine yeah. people who can build those real connections uh, with our clients, with those human beings, because they are also human beings. And it's on the basis of that trust that you can, that, that the sale happens, not the other way mm -hmm. around. Got it. Got it. That's a, a very interesting take on this, uh, Andrilla, because uh, you know, you talked about things which were very uh, unique and different from what Manish also touched upon. Um, and so it gives kind of the other lens of this whole, uh, you know, new era of work in which, yes, everybody is going through similar kind of experiences and it requires you to revisit the, you know, the more human uh, side of things, which is taking a step back, being more empathetic, making sure people are doing okay, whether it's your own team or your clients. So no, I think that's a great point and probably transcends again, just sales and probably applies to anybody who is a team leader to make sure, you know, that, uh, that people are doing work, but at the same time also um, are doing okay, you know, in terms of their health, in terms of their relationships, in terms of uh, being able to uh, meet the expectations that are uh, required from them. Uh, I think this is a good segue to the next part of our conversation, which uh, we have lined up here, which is uh, focused around skill sets, right? So this is one of the key questions we get all the time from people in sales and people outside of sales who want to get into sales is, um, you know, it's a very demanding task, right? You really have to be thick skinned. You have to um, be okay with taking, taking rejections all the time and still moving ahead like nothing happened. Um, and, you know, I think in the first part of conversation, Manish, you specifically touched upon, uh, you know, a couple of very hard skills that are going to be critical going forward, like, you know, being digital first, um, understanding Gen Z um, and, you know, data crunching, data analytics and those kind of things, which may not have been part of, you know, mainstream skill set of sales professionals to date. So uh, maybe we can really just kind of focus on this and talk about two or three skills um, uh, you know, that you feel are going to become more and more uh, critical in the coming times for sales. Um, Manish, again, maybe. Yeah. So let me, let me kind of break this up into two, two very distinct parts and let's call them as functional and call them as behavioral. Uh, and let me talk about the behavioral skills because that's what I think uh, that's what the chain of conversation has been till now. Uh, you know, uh, so, so behavioral skills, I think, I, I think if I were to summarize the three very critical behavioral skills that are there at a very, at a very macro level, I would call them as sincerity, I'll call them as ethics, and I'll call them as asking. Uh, three skills which I believe are, are absolutely uh, are required for any salesperson. <clears throat> when I say ethics, you know, uh, and so, sorry, when I say sincerity, you know, it is, you know, while we say, you know, flamboyant, while we say, you know, um, you know, um, uh, have to be very outgoing and uh, 
courageous of taking uh, of taking the elections. I believe that uh, sincerity is of is of is of utmost importance because end of the day. Uh, the customer, you know, buys your sincerity. He says, "How sincere is he in, in, in one understanding his own product, two in understanding my requirement, and three in fitting both together." Uh, so I believe, and 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 you know, people who are trying to pivot into sales, people who are trying to move into sales, I would really urge you not to listen to these stories of you know sales guys being you know. Liars or sales guys, you know, lying through the teeth, or sales guys being, being, you know, um, uh, uh, very outgoing. And no, not really. You know, you don't have to be any of these. Um, you know, in fact, uh, uh, the more sincerity and the more ethics that you bring to the table, I think that would really help you propel you really up. Uh, the last one that I would really want and urge everyone to have or develop is the skill of asking. You know, you need to ask questions. You need to. Every rejection is an opportunity to ask a question, a relevant question, to understand why the rejection has come. Mm-hmm. Most of the times, um, consumers reject you not because, not for the reason that they tell you that they're rejecting, you, but for the reason which is underlying the reason that they say. So, so, so very broadly, I would say, you know, sincerity, ethics, and asking. That's at a functional level. At a, at a behavioral level, sorry. At a functional level, I would, you know, um, uh, I, as I was mentioning earlier, I would say data analysis, you know, social media understanding, SEO, you know, email marketing, mobile marketing. These are few things that one must. I would believe one thing, you know, one one piece of really huge advice that I can give is, you know, make your life an indefinite a journey of indefinite learning. See what has happened is that, and sorry, Arjun, for giving a little bit of gap on this one, but I have a very strong belief in this. That you know, about two generations back, it was about a job. So people joined a job, they developed expertise over there, and they retired from there. A generation later, it was about skills. So you know, then you had engineers, and then you had you know, accountants. They were skilled. But they didn't stick to a particular company. They they stuck to an industry. They moved between industries, and you know, mm-hmm. the, the generation later, which is you know, like kind of my generation, was that we were neither very industry specific nor very very skill specific. You know, we shifted industries. You know, we were we were quite skill specific, but also in skills were developed. You know, we started from B two B two C, we moved to B two B, moved to social media marketing and stuff like that. I think the coming Days is going to be all about learning and relearning. You know, mm-hmm. the skills that you have today will become very relevant maybe ten years down the line. So, so the faster you are on the learning curve, the more you are learning. You know about what's going to happen tomorrow will keep you far more relevant uh, in the work that you're doing. Uh, the more you believe that I am a one industry, one spe- specific sector specialist. Are the more, are the faster, relevant, irrelevant that you will become. So I think it's going to be, you know, very critical at a so so at a at a at a, at a behavioral level, you know, sincerity, ethics, asking, three skills at a at a at a functional level, you know, digital, social media, uh, SEO, you know, email marketing, mobile marketing, the works. More than that, you know, what new Learning that you're doing maybe once in every 24 months is a question that one must ask and see in the last yeah. 24 months what is that I learned new, what is that I can add to my CV that is going to make me far more relevant uh, to the next guy. Got it. Got it. Okay. Uh, all really very relevant points and I like how you broke it down into both uh, functional level skills as well as behavioral skills. So, Andrew, uh, uh, Again, very important topic. We hear about this all the time. Uh, there are certain, you know, I would say my entrenched kind of uh, perceptions about uh, sales folks and the kind of skills they are required um, to have, especially in a market like India. Um, a lot of them continue. A lot of them might be shattered because of the pandemic and, you know, people have to reinvent themselves like Manish just said. So what, what are your thoughts on all of this? 
So I, I think, you know, um, reinventing yourself, of course, you always have to reinvent yourself, right? Beat any any line of work. You cannot, and, and especially with sales, your outcomes are very black and white. You cannot faff your way through uh, sales, right? At the end of the day, at the end of the quarter, you know exactly how you have performed. So uh, mm -hmm. that's one thing I love about sales, in fact. You know, because you 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 cannot lie to yourself at the end of the day. Yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, what I feel uh, pretty much in line with what Manish has uh, said, right? What he calls sincerity, I always say that sales is always about discipline. It is about being super, super disciplined. What I mean by that is now, again, and that's, that's my problem with certain flamboyant, flamboyant uh, portrayals of sales roles. You know, you watch a movie like Glenn, uh, Gary Glenn Ross, the line is always be closing. How will you always be closing? You have to always be prospecting. You yeah. always have to see that, okay, this is my target. My pipeline has to be 3x or 4x of my target. For my pipeline to be 3x or 4x of my target, I have to always, always, always be prospecting. I have to be a hawk and have a very, very keen eye on my market to know that, okay, these are my prospective customers. If not, uh, 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 you know, two months down the line, I will be converting them six months down the line. I have to be very disciplined in terms of my learning as well. In sales, you have to be okay being the dumbest person in the room. You are in trouble if you are the smartest person in the room, <laughs> right? You you have to be absolutely okay. You have to be have the humility to have the dumbest person in the room. So for me, when when in Amagi or even in Byte Dance, we would have these monthly product connects and stuff, right? I always have my. I'm one of those annoying people who always has their videos on. <laughs> because I, I I want to be absolutely, uh, I, I have, want to have that razor sharp attention to what the uh, product leaders are saying. If I don't understand my product, how will I ever solve my customer pain point? Very similar to what Manish said, right? You have to have that thorough understanding of your product and mm -hmm. marry that to the customer pain point. Only then, th that is your sincerity. That is your discipline. No one's going to buy, buy from you because, you know, you speak a certain way or you have a certain body language. They will buy from you because you understand their pain point. You're making their life easier through the product right. that you're selling. You're not hard selling something. You're selling something that you truly believe, believe in because you understand that product and you genuinely believe that it can solve for your customer's pain point. And to go back to the whole... Probably I, I sound like a broken record at this point in time, but to go back to the whole discipline uh, point, one of my managers, and this is something that I had learned from one of my managers, I always, wherever I work, I maintain a document, a personal document called Journal of Ignorance. Mm -hmm. And that in that document, every other day, I jot down jargons, maybe from the tech standpoint, maybe from behavioral standpoint that I did not know about. And I sincerely do that homework, write that down, understand what it means, because that is what allows me to build a robust pitch. Right. So that. those are those are certain skill sets that will hold you in good stead, irrespective of uh, whatever the situation is. Right. Whether you are having a bad year in sales and if you are in sales, you will have a tough year in sales. There is no way that you will have every year is going to be stellar. You will have tough times. You will have tough quarters. And what holds you in good stead are these things. It is your discipline. It is your sincerity. It is your um, openness to learning and saying that, okay, I, I mm -hmm. may, maybe the problem lies with me. I do not know what's going on. So let me go back to the drawing board. Maybe I need a better better understanding of my product. And the last thing, absolutely, you, you need to ask. You need to constantly ask your clients the right question. More important, both if, if they have not bought from you, why have they not bought from you? Because to Manisha's point, if they have not bought from you, they, it, it's not like they have anything personal against you. But mm -hmm. you couldn't solve for their pain point at that point in time. But that doesn't mean that it's permanent. No one has hard feelings for you, right? It's nothing personal. As soon as you figure out that pain point, how to solve for that pain point, they'll come back to you. And mm -hmm. if they have bought from you, what is it that worked for them? It's also very important to understand that why that sale worked. 
because how else will you make it a repeatable model of success so you need to keep asking the right kind of questions to your clients you also need to keep asking the right kinds of questions internally sometimes to convert a big sale you need the right kind of support internally but if you don't ask right. if you are in your silo who's going to understand no one will telepathically so, ever understand what you need right so you need to ask the right kind of questions to the leadership uh, in your organization as well right yeah. right just just one question there because it's a very good point that you just raised and manish and rila i mean either of you can you know, provide your perspective on this but you know we have been talking about managing clients and you know kind of driving prospects and all of that but andrela you just brought up the point about managing uh people internally right because whatever you hear during your prospect meetings your client meetings initially um you have to as a sales professional kind of relay those things internally right. for the product teams for the marketing teams tech teams etc how does that really uh you know play a, a role today again where things are evolving so rapidly and clients are you know asking for a very transformative or you know, new age products um and as somebody who is you know as you yourself said andrela not the smartest person in the room who may not understand all of the technicalities of the product right to take that feedback and relay it internally can be somewhat challenging sometimes so is there any thought there in terms of how uh, all of the feedback that sales people get uh, should be relayed internally I think one of the most imperative things for a sales person is to have great relations even within the organization. You need mm-hmm. to have a great relation with your product team. You need to build a great rapport with your leadership team. Um and that rapport relationship is again very very uh, dependent on how disciplined and sincere you are so that Mm-hmm. they understand that you are making that effort to understand the sort of work they are doing what are the feature releases that they are doing what is the importance of those feature releases if you are asking them to add an additional feature for example it's a hypothetical example for them to add a hypothetical feature you have to understand that it will be adding to their workload right so to speak to them in their language wherein you say that yes i understand that this will add these many hours of say it it will add x number of man hours but potentially this is the amount of revenue that we can expect from this change mm. to go to to the onboarding team to your support teams and say that you know guys we need to buckle up we we are doing a great job but we need to be more proactive in terms of solving customer problems once the customer has been onboarded because we don't yeah. want to lose out on a customer right we only want to keep upselling and cross selling to the to the customer right 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 once you won a new once you won a customer the biggest thing is to retain them so you need those excellent relationships with your onboarding teams as well so there are a lot of like of course there are those the same things around asking discipline sincerity that 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 are applicable here as well and uh, the whole thing around empathy a lot of these people like typically what i tend to do is sometimes when we have uh, meetings with our uh, clients right and we have our onboarding team members we have our pre sales team members there a lot of times people outside of your organization do not have a context of how much work is going on behind the curtains so typically mm-hmm. what i do is i always say that you know guys i completely understand that this is an issue for instance but do know that these guys have been working throughout the weekend to solve this issue you know first of all the clients also then suddenly you are humanizing your uh, you know the the teams that you collaborate with for the client right. and also the teams that you collaborate with suddenly they realize that okay fine we are working with someone who does understand our pain point as well so uh, you know they they give us the credit in the form and manner that you know letting the client know that it's not just the one 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 person one woman army who's uh, leading everything no doing everything there are yeah no absolutely thank that right and absolutely. to give those people the name and the credit in the forum in a public forum that 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 works you know by leaps and bounds the next yeah. time there is a client issue they will be super pro- proactive to solve that issue for you as opposed to someone who's not gone ahead and thank them or empathize with them it it comes yeah. down to those soft and hard skills a combination of both no very true very true 
And and Manish, uh, same question to you. I mean, you have had such a long journey. Have you seen any sort of uh, you know evolution in how you have yourself managed your relationships and the way you work internally with other teams outside of sales? I think you know you sell at three levels. One, you go and sell to the customer. Then two, you come back and you sell what you sold to the customer to the internal team. You know what Angela, what Angela was mentioning in terms of you know uh, how good it is going to be for revenue. So you know first you sold to the customer, then what the customer needs, you come back and sell to the internal team and say, look, you know this is so great for us. And the third several sales you do is when you understand how much you can deliver, you go back to the customer and say, look, this is what you asked, but actually what you will get is this, which is in fact better than what you were asking for. So I think I think sales happen at these three levels. Sell to the consumer, come back to it internally, and then figure out what can be delivered and go back and sell it to last to the customer. I, I think largely, largely you need to keep managing these three things all the time, mm-hmm. every step I, of the way. That is a, I think, really clear and fantastic way to put it. Basically, sales just does not happen at one touch point. There are multiple touch points across the whole journey with multiple stakeholders internally and externally. Um, yeah, you know, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, for example, yeah. you know, even if you're having a price negotiation, you come back and you know, I come back and sell it to my finance team. How you know how good it is going to be for us, even if we drop the price. Right. You know, so, so, so you sell at every level. Right, right. Yeah, and I think it can get very tricky, right? Because uh, as a sales professional, I think number one most important things that they're incentivized based on is the goals, the you know, quarterly or annual goals that are set. Uh, I know there are certain organizations which have, you know, different take on it, uh, especially during the pandemic because, you know, pandemic created a lot of uh, uh, macro challenges. But at the same time, you know, when uh, a sales professional is being pulled by this, you know, quarterly goal hanging over his or her head, um, and then also trying to manage, you know, multiple stakeholders where, you know, you might be trying to fill your sales quota for the for the quarter, but you don't want to drop the price too much because that's what your product team or your tech team is telling you. Um, so there can be a lot of these kind of tricky situations, I imagine. Uh, any, any way to, you know, manage these difficult situations where, you know, one side is telling one thing, the other side is telling something else. You know, I think you need to be very sure of, you know, which side of the bed you want to sleep on. Uh, you know, you have to be very sure of, of, of whose side you are playing. You know, uh, you know being customer centric doesn't mean that you sell your organization to, 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 to you know, give the product free to the consumer. Uh, you know, yeah. uh, being, uh, you know, being profitable doesn't mean that you, that you suck the blood out of everyone that you interact with. Uh, so you have to balance it somewhere. But I think very clearly one has to decide which side of the bed you want to sleep on. Uh, largely at times, uh, and it happens with everyone, all of us, you know, we let go of yeah. sales because ultimately you realize that it's not good for the organization. And mm-hmm. finally, the brass tag is that, you know, you work for the organization that you work for and their interest is paramount. Because once you fulfill that interest is only when will, then will you be able to get products that, that are going to fulfill the, the consumer interest. Right, no great product came out of loss making organizations you know, until it was a you know public sector undertaking. But, you know, otherwise, you know, no, no great product comes from a loss making organization. No, so, so, as long as you make clear, uh, and, and as Andre was mentioning earlier, uh, you win some, you lose some. Yeah. yeah, at times you lose more than you win, which is fine. Okay. It, it, it eventually evens out, it will eventually even out. I mean, you stay long enough to know that there are multiple different situations and there are multiple different ways to deal with those situations. Okay, I think just, uh, you know, kind of uh, going to the next topic and we we have a couple of questions coming in here, but one thing that I do want to discuss, given your backgrounds in tech and uh, until especially yours in, in a SaaS, um, you know, firm, I mean, SaaS has been the biggest breakout story of the last two year, three years, at least since uh, the pandemic, right? I think um, I read a recent Motila Lawswal report where it said uh, India's SaaS industry is expected to 
grow to about 50 billion dollars uh, by the end of this decade right now, which is huge um, and there are a lot of great opportunities for sales folks within saas right so uh, what are some of the key things that uh, you know new professional in sales can do to break into tech or break into saas um so again by the way the things that i keep mentioning those hold true even before you start prepping for these roles right mm-hmm. you really need to as a layman as well like when i was interviewing for amagi or earlier when i was interviewing for bite dance or cr seven the amount of homework i had done for each of these roles i i would say that i don't know whether it was the best or not but at least that was the best that i could have done given mm-hmm. that i had another job given that i have certain roles and responsibilities in my personal life as well given the amount of time that i had i think i had done the best job i could have done with that time right and there is no i don't think there is any substitute to that kind of hard work you have to if you want to break into a saas role or a tech role you have to do that homework to what manish was saying as well right if you are breaking into you want to break into a role where you want to do say e-commerce sales or you want to do uh, sales in that sort of in, uh, industry where you have a daily run rate you have to have an mm-hmm. understanding of seo you have to have an understanding of the entire digital marketing landscape otherwise you can't do that because your goals are very very closely tied to performance marketing uh, goals right so if you don't understand performance marketing how will you ever hit your daily run rate similarly in in this kind of a saas role you really need to understand what are the products what are the product lines for instance i i literally had to break it down that there are broadly three product lines that amagi has broadly mm-hmm. within that this is the workflow of the first product line this is the workflow of the second product line this is the workflow of the third product line i was tested on those skills mm-hmm. i was actually asked to present in my interviews that how would you present this workflow was i 100% right no but did i come across as someone who had put in the hard work to understand as a layman did i do well enough to put in that hard work and exhibit that yeah i i am interested enough to learn the brass tacks of this business it literally comes down to that when i was shifting from hindustan times to savan for instance um again it's it in that sense that was also a shift because i was working for cnbc i had been working for hindustan times very different worlds from mm. a landscape to you know where you are selling digital audio ads so literally what i had done was i i i was like if i get into savan this is what my uh, pipeline will look like my pipeline growth the way i'm expecting my pipeline to grow is on the basis of these metrics i had gone down to you know to the level of reading reports from the iab any ad metric uh, reports that are there what is the growth rate of search advertisements what is the growth rate of display advertisements what is the growth rate of uh, social media advertisements so on and so forth and based on that how can one predict that what is the growth rate of audio ads how will that reflect in india which probably follows which which lags behind the us maybe by 3 or 4 years in most of these trends and then accordingly build that pipeline plan so then you know that sure this person comes from a slightly different industry but this person is very very interested to put in the hard work to understand the the nitty gritties of this industry so we we are taking a bet but by and large it's a safe bet that, that is what you need to do you you have to empathize with the interviewer right the interviewer is is taking a call the hiring manager is taking a call by bringing you into his or her team and for that to happen you need to give that person the confidence that yes i am going to put in uh, the i i am going to approach this in a very disciplined way i am going to continuously learn and ensure that the fact that i come from a d- different industry is not going to come into the way of me doing my job literally that's what it boils down to got it um yeah a lot of great insights there manish i think you have also had you know a whole career outside of tech before you finally joined oyo or perhaps i don't know if you'd consider vodafone a tech company or not necessarily um 
but what are some of the key things you noticed which were you know somewhat different or starkly different um, in the non tech sectors you worked in versus tech uh, from a sales career standpoint lastly i believe that what angel was saying was is absolutely right i lastly i believe that you know it's the uh, you know whether it's tech or non tech i think it's more about a question of the 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 baseline ethics or the work ethics i think i think that that's the baseline and every mm-hmm. great organization is built around those those baseline work ethics you know skill is mm-hmm. something as onil was saying was that you put in the hard work to to study to to learn and that is something that you can learn and then you can adapt yourself to it uh, yeah. you know i think i think largely if i were to kind of compare a tech and a non tech company in terms of uh, you know the skill requirement um you know obviously the skill requirements are different you know a tech or a company would look for somebody you know who understands who has an inherent understanding of it uh, would look for someone you know who has an aptitude for it uh, you know yeah. also and yeah. not not everyone will have an aptitude for it so so obviously you know you would look for those things similarly you know like if i were interviewing for say procter and gamble tomorrow they would look for someone you know who Who, who understands the retail market? Uh, you know, who understands distribution? Uh, during this conversation, I would want to say one thing. You know, put it on record as uh, uh, while the while the future is moving towards digital and uh, digital, uh, you, know, uh, you know, skills are going to become great in demand. That would necessarily not mean that the traditional sales is going to die down very soon. and people who are in traditional sales um, need not lose heart uh, you know i mean traditional sales crew continues to be as strong as ever maybe the the, the large part or maybe a part of it might move from a rural to from a from a from a very urban to a maybe a semi urban and then move towards rural but then it will continue to be very very relevant um, you know a lot of people who are in the last uh, in the in the the in the traditional sales can also find look for great opportunities in the last mile um part of a lot of digital organizations mm-hmm. at the end of the day you know till the time till the time you find a way of digitally delivering goods you know the human interface and 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 the last mile specialization will always remain uh, you know so, yeah. so 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 that is also a skill that that can come to great use uh, no even 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 in a very tech driven company uh, but largely uh, i i believe that you know as long as you have an aptitude for that for that role and as long as you know you have the hard work of learning i i really i really you know uh, uh, completely agree with what you know andrew was saying in terms of preparation uh, mm-hmm. you know even within organizations you know so for 14 years in vodafone i i shifted jobs and i shifted profiles you know Uh, quite a few times, and every time, you know, I had to show an aptitude towards towards a new profile. I had to, you know, show or and it's more difficult, you know, when you are within the same organization because people have been observing you for a very long time. So, you know, mm-hmm. so you have to, you know, then you know you have to very very uh, focused work on it and and show, um, you know, to people that that you have the aptitude to move to the to uh, and to learn new things. Uh, so as long as you have that, you know, I I believe. If, if if one were to learn or if one were to kind of remember one thing that i would want us to leave behind would be that you know coming few years if you have to survive in this market it has to be about continuous learning those yeah. days of acquiring one skill and then you know, probably i i still have few years left in my career but probably i spent the last part of my career by by surviving on one skill you know mm-hmm. um, i don't think I don't think it's going to happen for the next few months. That yeah. would not happen. No, that's very true. I'm I'm surprised that a little surprised, not very surprised that that applies to even sales because it is very very true for a lot of the you know core tech roles where engineers are learning new programming languages every third year, right? But I think from a sales standpoint, also for you know Manish, somebody like you to say that, I think it holds a lot of weight. Um, I just I think uh, you know we have only a few minutes left, so I want to ask to a uh, basic but very important questions that we get and we have it here also from somebody um, number one is 
let's say i am somebody from outsides of sales i have never done any sales in my life uh, from a you know core sales function standpoint i may have been let's say either a consultant marketer or something else right would you as an employer as a hiring manager take a chance on me and what are some of the things you would look for exactly um to say that yes this person while they don't have any experience in sales could potentially be a good fit in our team well i i would say if i were to get some advice you know i would say as the say in bombay you know dhande ki samajh you know mm-hmm. an inherent understanding of business what do you look for when you look for a guy in sales i mean for a guy in sales is somebody who has an inherent understanding of business you understand business instinctively you know intuitively you have an understanding of business and again i'm saying it is not about product you might not know my product you might not know my technology but you need to have the inherent understanding of business you need to have an inherent understanding of the of how the consumer thinks i think everything else will fall in place i'll, I'll give you an example uh, but you know many few years back in my previous organization we were looking for i was in those days handling the digital part of the of the vodafone business and we were developing a lot of digital apps for consumption within for consumers and then i'm talking about 5 6 years back when you know, the digital apps were coming into place and atm was was to be done right and and we were looking and i would, and we were looking for someone you know who could who could help us develop these apps and all that and we picked up a guy uh, from internally from the it team from, from our own it team a guy who was an out and out tech guy but that guy has an inherent what i would say dhande ke sam you know he understood the customer he understood business you know he understood you know how to pitch and that was not that he had ever done it but few interactions and he figured out that the guy had that intuitive knowledge in him and today you know he i'm very proud of of, of all that he has been doing for the last few years and he still continues with the organization and he's doing fantastically well so i think it's yeah. it's it's more about you know intuitively you know you need to have that knack to mm-hmm. sorry for saying it again dhande ki samajh yeah so you know i, I think that will stick to... with me for the rest of my life manish dhande ki samajh <laughs> I, i think it's a very <laughs> good uh, way to sum it up when we, yeah when we used to you know recruit guys as 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 uh, dsc you know the the the, the front line guy who used to go and sell to the to the to the the dukandar to the to the retailer all that we knew was you understand percentages mm-hmm. can you understand percentages can you calculate 20% of 150 how quick can you do that i don't know the real life guy knew that it was he will but because mm-hmm. other things you will the other thing you will teach got it got it anjala uh, so i mean i think manish has really spelled it out well yeah. anything just to be devil's advocate here anything that a person can actually do which may not be like in, let's say i'm somebody who's not very you know intuitive about business understanding uh, right i may understand at a high level but i i have not done any pitching i have not done any like core sales what are some of the things i can do Uh, that will help me land a role in sales and it could be a short term or a long term process um i think if you don't if if you you don't have that inherent dhande ki samajh um mm-hmm. as manish put it and very beautifully you know succinctly put it um i i think then it will you have to accept that it will be a long term process to shift to sales and there is nothing wrong with that if you are really mm-hmm. hell bent on building a career in sales or for that matter any line of work and you don't have the basic skill set it's fine you can always build that skill set but you have to be then mm-hmm. okay with the you have to accept emotionally mentally experientially that it will be a slightly long term process and that's fine in that during that intervening period what you need to do is work towards um, developing those business skills right you need to understand now say i am someone who wants to build a career in uh, saas sales for instance fair enough what is what are the movers and shakers of the business how do the how does the decision making at the buying process happen 
it's a long term sales right typically it's a long long sales cycle so in that long sales cycle what is it that we do mm -hmm. from the demo to the poc to the various stages what are the various stages that one has to do you have to do that homework to understand what are the different steps of the sales cycle and you have a mm -hmm. teen number of courses out there I had done that despite having done sales. I had done that because I wanted to ship to SaaS sales. I wanted to understand how is the sales cycle, you know, fun, the, how does that funnel work in the SaaS world as opposed to the ad sales world? Mm -hmm. So you will also have to do that. There are, But the good thing is there are enough courses out there. You don't even need to do a full-blown MBA. If you want to do it, nothing like it. If you have the time, if you have the resources, go ahead, do that. If you don't have those resources, there are enough number of short courses, short form content that are very instructional for you to understand what it is. The second thing is develop the soft skill of being able to read the room. You need to be able to read the room. You need to understand, have the dhande ki samaj and a dhanda is never divorced from people. It, the people are the are at the the heart and soul of any dhanda. You have to be able to read the room. Is your pitch landing? Is it too long? Is it too short? Did people not understand it? Yeah, and kind of are, improvise are along able, the way, I guess. Yeah, you need to improvise along the way. Are people are you able to hold people's attention or not? Are you able to ensure that you 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 have an audience? But how do you retain that audience through say a thirty minute? Uh, a one hour conversation, do mock pitches, do mock pitches with your friends. If you do not have the confidence to do it with interviewers, do mock pitches with your friends who can give you that constructive criticism that yaar, main bore ho gaya. Kuch to bol tha, but uske baad main thoda, matlab, overhead transmission ho gaya. That's great feedback. That means that you did not hold your audience, right? So these are certain things that um, if you do not have those basic skill sets, a be okay with a long drawn process and that's absolutely fine that's mm -hmm. that's okay and if you're going for that long drawn process we have to be very thankful and grateful that we are in a time and age when there are umpteen number of resources out there for us to learn those skills to pick up those skills both instructional right. educational skills in terms of say sales cycle so on and so forth and soft skills like how do you pitch how do you hold uh, uh, your audience's attention speak to your yeah. friends speak to your partner P pitch pitch those decks in front of your partner yeah. if you, if you um, have a supporting partner absolutely do that let that person and be open to constructive criticism it may hurt in the beginning but it will hold you in good stead over the long longer run so um, yeah, I, I would say. Yeah, I think those are some definitely internalize constructive criticism. Makes a Sorry, lot of sense. Another else. thing, you know, another thing that really landed well, right? In terms of what can people actually do in case they are not there with Dhande Ki Samaj or you know instinctive understanding of business and people. And I like how some of the solutions you presented, Anjali, are you know very uh, cost and time. Uh, efficient right you you don't necessarily have to go to business school to kind of uh, practice pitching and uh, you know doing your own research on what a sales cycle might look like for saas firms i i know we are past our time but uh, manish and andrela if you have maybe three more minutes for one last question uh, we can just take that one and then wrap it up is that okay yes okay sure. so uh, thank you so much I think the last and final question here is similar to what we just discussed. Let's say I'm a sales professional who's been within the organization and the industry for over, let's say, seven, eight years, right? This is the time where I'm almost starting to, you know, uh, start my family and, you know, my personal commitments are changing. I want to rise up my career ladder. I want to grow really from a financial standpoint and, you know, overall career development standpoint. What would be the number one advice you would give to them. So maybe Andrela, this time you can go first. Um, I think um, first of all, um, if this is something that, you know, you want to start a family, you have certain personal commitments, you have certain liabilities uh, that, that, you know, show up that that's something that happened in the pandemic. People who did not, you know, before the pandemic did not have liabilities, certain, suddenly have certain liabilities in terms of taking care of their family and stuff because mishaps have happened. Um, I think um, one key thing is um, 
to what i have learned over time is that um, to work for organizations first of all to you it, it's not just that an organization chooses you you are also choosing to work for that organization the choice also lies in your own hands so do that homework figure out that is this an organization that supportive or not right because you you need certain you need certain flexibilities in your life to to be able to juggle every other aspect of your life so that's that's one of the most obvious things but we tend to forget that when we are in the process of interviewing when we are in the process of running the race we forget that we are also the choice also lies in our hands we are yeah. also making a choice to work for that organization so it is in our, it is our duty to figure out whether that organization is a supporting organization or not right so that's number one once you are in that organization i think when i say again to sound like a broken record when i say that you know it is sales or for that any mat for for that matter any role is a lot about discipline right when you have that discipline you can plan out your day one of the things another thing that i had learned from one of my previous managers was that don't get hell bent on a to do list your task list will never end yeah. look at your calendar you know that these are the number of waking hours that you have say you are a new mother you have probably x number of waking hours within that x number of waking hours a certain percentage you dedicate to your personal life or certain percentage you dedicate to your work life break the percentage of work life that you have dedicated for yourself into specific tasks that key tasks important tasks that you can do in that day in the case of a sales person probably that would be one hour of prospecting trying to figure out who are my prospective clients two hours of uh, speaking to uh you know uh pitching to uh clients to close those deals in that quarter maybe one hour of you know solving problems for clients who have already already been onboarded but there are certain mm -hmm. issues and you you don't want that to happen right you want want to solve for those issues so that you can continually upsell to that client so you can divide your day into the three four broad metrics of ensuring that you have a healthy looking quarter mm -hmm. just divide your calendar Got you'll it. be surprised that how much you can get done with that sort of an approach rather than being in a frenzied manner you you may have counterparts who are working probably 3x the number of hours but probably you are getting more done in the day because right. you are doing it in a in an organized way you have your calendar instead of being obsessed with to do lists instead of being obsessed with task lists be obsessed with your calendar you'll have you you'll you'll lead a more peaceful life i think that's 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 the truth for anyone who wants to maintain a work life balance that's how you go about it got it um yeah no, that's that's an interesting take and manish your thoughts on like somebody who is you know at that level in the organization but while maintaining work life balance is also trying to get a promotion to let's say become a team manager which obviously helps them with the work life balance because now they can delegate things and all that but the other uh, goal here is to really just kind of rise up the career ladder and find um, you know a more senior better role with greater responsibilities and impact yeah so uh, my belief is that um, you know um, uh, um, there is uh, the only way to grow in life is to upgrade and uh, you know um, and uh, you know uh, uh, growth can growth can be both lateral as well as vertical so let's let's kind of look at both very quickly i think uh, for both you would need new skills and as andre lavery actually said you know getting new skills would really mean that you you manage what you're doing right now with what is that you want to do um you know if you want to go let's say you want to move up vertically let's say you are on a you know front line role and you want to move to a role which <clears throat> which requires team management and obviously the first i think it's very 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 critical that that you know that that you have leadership skills and i think leadership skills is such a it's an abused word you know for everything you use leadership skills i think leadership skill is more about you know a uh, behavioral leadership where you have an understanding of each and every one of your team members and we do that 
in every day's life. You know, for example, the way I argue with my daughter is different from the way I argue with my wife. So, uh, uh, seriously, I mean, teenage daughter, you argue quite a lot, right? So, so the you know, but, but the way I argue with both of them is quite different. Right? The same way, the way you handle one team member of yours and the way you handle the other team is completely different. Different upon the kind of skill set that they have, the kind of experience that they have, the kind of nature that they have. So you'll have to learn to you'll have to learn to work on these skills. You'll have to learn to build these skills. Uh, very very critical, and and that's where I see a lot of sales guys failing is moving from an individual role to a team role. Is where the the first big hurdle is where a lot of people fall. Is because you have to then go with the uh, you know the way the armed forces say, you know my men before me. Uh, you know, in the same way, when you're leading a team, that's how it becomes. Not that you sacrifice yourself for your team, but you know, you'll have to at times put your team's interest before you. Uh, you know, understand that there will be months when you will not earn your incentive. There will be quarters when you will not make money because your team has not made, been making money, and you'll have to work the hard way to, you know, to to ensure that they make money for you. To put it very crudely, now I mean. Uh, so, so, so primarily, you know, you have to be very, very. Um, uh, every time you have to move up in your life, or you want to change something, you, the only way left is to upgrade. That's that's a vertical. For horizontal, also a lot of times within organizations, you find roles which are maybe in different functions, in different verticals that can be far better pay, can have far better, you know, uh, opportunities future. Uh, there also, obviously, it's a question of you know upgrading yourself, um, acquiring those skills, uh, more than acquiring those skills, displaying those skills. Um, a lot of times, we say when it comes to promotions or when it comes to promoting people, I always go with a thumb rule saying that the guy has to be 60% ready, which means that he should be displaying at least 50 to 60% of the skills or the requirements of the next row. 100% he will never, but at least 50 to 60% of his displaying today, then I'll take a bet on him and, and you know, be a rest assured that he'll start displaying 100% in coming months. So, so you'll have to start doing that, whether it's a vertical movement or a, or a horizontal movement, you have to start displaying those skills, you'll have to start displaying those, those requirements. And, um, and you know, again, I'm going back and saying, you know, keep learning. It has to be an endless journey of learnings, or yeah. else, you know, still water stagnates. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, beautifully put, Manish. Thank you so much for uh, sharing that depth of knowledge that comes only with experience, and uh, Andrela, you as well. Um, you know, some very, very deep learnings and a lot of great actionable insights. You know, one thing I've always found as salespeople are always very like practical, right? There's no beating around the bush. It gets straight to the point, whether it's good or bad. So I like, uh, you know, how you really cut to the chase on all of the questions that I was asking and were not diplomatic at all. <laughs> I really appreciate that. And again, just want to thank you for making time for this. Uh, really, really, really appreciate it. I think it's going to be tremendously beneficial for a lot of the users who were um, you know, who joined us today and the ones who are going to view it later in their own free time. Um, and last, thank you to everybody who could make time on a late Thursday to be with us. Uh, thank you so much. And, uh, you know, we'll keep doing these workshops. We'll perhaps do another one on sales very soon. So uh, stay tuned and do check our website out at www.mypivot.org. It's in the chat section here. In case you need any help with you're achieving your career goals or transitioning into sales, you can come and speak with people like Andrela, people like Manish to get very personalized one-on-one -on -one guidance on how you can actually uh, reach your ultimate career goals. So with that, I just want to wrap this up and thanks. Uh, thank everyone once again. Hope you all have a great night. Thanks, thank you, Andrela, and thanks, Manish. Thank you. Thank you, Arjun. Thank, right. thank you. Take care. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye.